Hello, uh, Economics National University Academy students. This is Mr. Goyette uh, reviewing with you um, Unit 4, Chapters 7, 8, and 9 of your whole economics text textbook. Now, some of the things we've been discussing are unlimited liabilities, sole proprietorships, uh, issuing stocks, um, supply and demand, goods and services, limited liability, um, and going over some of the basics of business. Um, what I'm going to go over today are some of the things that you will see on the quiz to prepare you for that because we have a lot of things that we've been discussing in our class live sessions and in, a, in the classroom um, will have found their way onto the quiz. So these are the things that you'll need to review in order to do well on that quiz. Um, okay, so one of the first things you'll want to think about are the disadvantages of sole proprietorship that could directly affect an owner's family. And of course on page 152 of your textbook, um, you will see that unlimited liability, potential for conflict, and lack of uh, longevity are the three major issues there. But the one that uh, could affect an owner's family that they list at the top there is unlimited liability. Why is that? It's because if you lay, if, if you're the sole proprietor, um, if you you uh, you fronted the money for this venture. You invested in it with your own capital. That means with your own cash, with your own with your own money. So if if you took out a loan for that and you still need to pay that loan, and it's time the the uh, time comes up where you you have to send in your payment, and you, three of your fellow business people decided, well, you know what, I'm out of the venture. I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, you, there's two left. Well, now the two that are remaining have to chip in and pay the the entire um, requirement for that for that loan for that month otherwise you'll default default on the loan uh, disadvantages of partnerships include um, unlimited liability potential for conflict and lack of longevity the business organization that can hire workers and own property as if it were an individual is a sole proprietorship, the subject of which we're, we're discussing right now. The most common way that corporations raise funds is by issuing stock. That's corporations now. <clears throat> Two advantages of corporations that benefit stockholders are flexibility and limited liability. Let's go over to, now we've talked about unlimited liability. Let's look at limited liability for a second. Um, Let's see, you'll want to turn to uh, da, 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 da. issues. Actually, let's not look at limited liability right now. I'll come back to that. Um, next part would be uh, major disadvantage of corporate mergers would be increased, um, or major advantage of corporate mergers would be increased efficiency. The price of labor and workers' wages is determined by supply and demand and demand for resources derives or follows from consumers demand for goods and services. Uh, number of women in the labor force is increasing presently. Relationship between the workers education and his or her income level is direct. Uh, a situation in which workers cannot be hired unless they are union members is called a closed shop. Uh, and in recent decades union membership has dropped dramatically because of employer opposition, changing employment patterns, and negative public opinion. One of the things that the textbook does not highlight, which your, your U.S. history and AP U.S. history textbooks go into, is that a lot of the issues that the um, unions were dealing with in terms of safe working areas, um, a fair wage, um, having uh, health care, etc. Some of these things that were fought for in the 19, uh, in the early 1900s, up into the 1960s, were issues that um, may, in some cases, are still around. But in, in for the majority, in the majority of the industries in the United States, many of those things are, many of those safeguards are commonplace, or many of those um, things that the union would fight for are now granted by the company. Uh, for example, for example, setting up um, significant health care or OSHA coming in and making sure that your building is safe. So these things are, are kind of uh, part and parcel, part of the, uh, mot the regular mode of operations for your company, so they're not requiring as much unions to step in and solve these problems. Does that mean unions aren't still around? They certainly are. Um, they, tend, they tend to be in your more um, specialized
specialized trades. <clears throat> in recent decades, union membership has dropped because of employer opposition, changing employment patterns, and negative public opinion. Negative public opinion arose during a period where um, there were there were a lot of riots, the strike uh, strikes were happening, and it was uh, the public started to say, "Okay, well, I know you want your rights, but of course you're making it worse for the rest of us." The refusal to buy a product, any firm that does business with a company whose employees are on strike is of course called a secondary boycott. In response to a strike, management might um, hire replacement workers or scabs, institute a lockout, or ask for an injunction. People save money um, for major purchases to buy large annual and semi-annual bills for unexpected expenses. Um, So people save money for three core things that we studied in the course were for major purchases, to pay large annual, semi-annual bills, and for unexpected purposes. It's for all three of those reasons. The payment that financial institutions receive in return for making loans is called interest. Uh, an advantage of a regular savings account is its liquidity, your ability to draw that money out when you want to. So normally, if, uh, I, if I buy stock, um, I can't just run down the, to uh, the bank and say, hey, can I get five bucks out of my stock? It doesn't work that way. It would uh, be hard to get at that money, and I have to wait till if, if I had, say, a, a, a 401k or a 403b, and I wanted to, and this money's being saved for me so that for my retirement or for, uh, for 10 or 15 years down the line where I can access it so it accrues so a significant balance and enough interest to be a substantial investment. Well, they don't want me dipping into that every five minutes. It's not that type of fund. So the advantage, of course, of a savings or, or, um, or checking account is its liquidity, your ability to move the money when you want to move it. Using money to create new capital goods is called diversification. Um, Another, uh, I'm going to come back to that one too in, in a, at a later time. Um, the difference between the higher selling price and the stock at a lower original price is the investor's capital gain. Um, diversi diversification in terms of your stock portfolio though is when you have a variety of stocks in your stock portfolio. So if I say if I have a mutual fund, for example, and if it's and it's all invested in say oil. Um, oil companies and petro petroleum. Uh, if the market's bad for petroleum, then that mutual fund is not going to be balanced and, and diversified enough to where it has a little bit of the biomedical, it has a little bit of the um, <coughs> has a little bit of uh, international stocks, it has a little bit of um, defense contractors in it. If I balance those out and split them up, then if one industry takes a dive and another industry is rising, that'll it'll balance me out. Now in our current market, uh, there's not a lot of room for either side. It's kind of tough for for both groups. I'm going to pause here because we're, I'm going to come back and we're going to go over a few more things for the quiz. So I got to just wrap this up so we don't go over our time. I'll do these segments in about 10 minute um, 10 minute increments. So I'll be right back with you for review for Unit 4 Economics. <laughs>